Hello, and welcome to Theater, All the Moving Parts. I'm your host, Patrick Pacheco, here at Shea Josephine on Manhattan's Theater Row, directing the spotlight to those artists whose commitment is as inspiring as it is brave. Brave, as well as prolific, describes today's guest, playwright Teresa Rebeck. Since her Broadway debut with 2007's Mauritius, she has continued to challenge audiences, including in her most recent forays, Bernhard Hamlet and Off-Broadway's Downstairs. Among her TV and film credits are the series Smash and the movies Trouble and Bad Behavior, both of which she wrote and directed. Welcome, Teresa, to all the moving parts, and boy, your career is full of them. You've written novels, you've written and directed countless television shows, you've written and directed films, and yet you say, in essence, you are a playwright. Why does playwriting have primacy in your career? I just self-identified as a playwright from very young, and so I've been writing plays since, you know, high school, and uh, so I came to other things grew out of that. And I never saw playwriting as something to move on from, which I think ha does happen legitimately to some people. It was always something that I continued to um, pursue and investigate and, uh, while I was trying out other things as well. It's a, it's, so it remains kind of at the center of my instrument. 30 plays later, you are one of the most produced playwrights in America, one of the 10 most produced playwrights, and you are the most produced female playwright in America. <laughs> okay, um, cool. <laughs> you've said that you write plays because you write them to explore questions that you are intrigued by. What intrigued you, what issues intrigued you about Bernhard Hamlet, which was one of your latest oh. plays? Uh, largely, I think Bernhard Hamlet is about an uh, artist yeah. trying to push the, the level of her artistry to move into something unknown to her and to challenge her own greatness, um, which I think a lot of artists do. And in this particular instance, the, one of the challenges was the perception of uh, how gender um, stands in, in front of uh, certain, you know, the ability for certain actors to move into a part that is powerful for them. What did you discover in the process of writing the play? that perhaps you didn't oh. know before, weren't sure of? You know, I did a lot of research for that play, and at some point when you've done a lot of research, you kind of have to put it aside and just write out of what you've absorbed. So one of the things I discovered was her really deep relationship to uh, the playwright Edmund Rostand, uh, which I didn't know about until I really started looking into her um, more intently. And so the question about, and also the question about rewriting Hamlet and why that would be important to her and devastating to him, I understood innately how that would just be something. I know people are doing it. I don't know why you'd do it, because it sort of terrified me and, terif and then terrified the character when he was asked to do it. It's interesting that you say that you do research and then you kind of put it aside because in the play, Bernhardt refuses to do Roxanne, but in fact she actually did play Roxanne. Yeah, she did later In New on. York, actually. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and when you made that decision, was it because you were thinking of her just as a character? Did you want to rewrite history in any way by doing so? I approached it, I think, the way a sensible person would, which is that I wasn't interested in like writing a biopic. I was more interested in like what uh, Schaefer had done with uh, Amadeus, where you take aspects of of the story, the uh, you know the psychological, fascinating aspects of the story, and let them call the shots. I took very few uh, liberties with mm -hmm. uh, uh, with history, and in fact, you probably couldn't prove that what I wrote didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> you mean but, at first that she did reject it and then yeah, later yeah, thought, yeah, well, for you the know, money I better I, do it. You, yeah, <laughs> well, oh no, I, I think she did reject She didn't do the original production of it. Right, right. And she was very three much... three years later after yeah, the production. Mm -hmm. It's a potent argument because I think, it, forgive me, I'm paraphrasing here, but at yeah, that point, Bernhardt makes the argument that Roxanne is beneath a woman to play. It's uh, certainly beneath her. Beneath yeah. her to, yeah. to play it. And it always got a response, and that's been central to your writing in terms of feminist issues or in terms of women's issues mm -hmm. and what is uh, beneath or just a play thing. Or as she says in the play, a woman with power is a freak. 
in that evolution of your plays that started in 1992 with Spike Heels, really, how has that changed, that idea that a woman with power is a freak? I think it's still very problematic in the in the culture at large, and I, you know, I wish it were less problematic in uh, showbiz. It's still, it's still too lively for all of us, I think. Uh, yeah. Do you think that we underestimate just how powerful that double standard still is? I think we do. You know, there was one point when I finally said to somebody, I'm not a second class citizen. I sort of have never seen myself as a second class citizen. I go, I'm, I have a, a peculiar, well not peculiar, I was raised in Cincinnati by Catholic Republicans. And so I'm essentially an escapee from a, you know, a part of the country that's mystifying to a lot of people right now. I have a lot of information. I have a lot of relatives. But I'm not of that mindset anymore. I, I, I was raised in it and I had to sc scoot away. I very much believed, having been raised in Ohio and gone to Catholic school and all that, that I was taught about the Enlightenment, about democracy, and that everybody's born equal in this country. So it was astonishing. I mean, this is within a Catholic context where they were constantly saying, and the girls go over there, and the book girls don't get to do the readings at mass, and the girl, you know, there was all that stuff, and I still thought, I was the one sitting there going, well, why not? because that didn't make any sense to me. And, and I was told that I had a lousy, rotten attitude, and I thought, I don't have a lousy, <laughs> rotten attitude, I have a lot of questions, and, you know, because it never convinced me, nothing ever convinced me that I was a second-class citizen. It remains mystifying to me when that shows up, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it does. The, the Ursuline nuns, I think, uh, yes. uh, raised you, and, and you grew up in a family <laughs> they did. They did. Uh, uh, five, uh, five, six, siblings. Six, five siblings. Five siblings, five siblings, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think four sisters and two brothers. Uh, three, three sisters, sisters and, and two, two brothers. brothers. Yeah. And out of this education, Notre Dame as well, uh, did you, what is central to your plays, which is this great moral sense? It seems to me that all of your plays deal with morality. To some I believe extent. that that's accurate. Yes, I, th I think so. You know, Tina Howe used to talk about this. Yeah, there was one point when I read something that she wrote to somebody on my behalf, you know, and she said, Teresa carries her altar with her. And I thought, okay, well, that, that's sort of shocking. Tina's always right. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think that that's true. And I think that I, that there's a strong strain of uh, Catholic intellectualism that uh, is part of my training, you know. In terms of those uh, moral issues, is it a question, as Tennessee Williams writes, that in a play, everybody is right? So that even, say, Jerry in Downstairs, who is this abusive husband, obviously, to right. Tyne Daly and Tim Daly, were in it. Tim plays uh, Tyne Daly's brother, who's in this basement, living in this basement. I know, I loved that. And Jerry is this oppressive, almost demonic presence, or described as a demonic presence. Can you, as the writer, have empathy for Jerry? Uh, yes. Every, every character is right. You know, I... You cannot judge your characters while you're writing them. You have to really stand inside them and understand why they're doing what they do. Whether or not you agree with it is uh, is a is a question for after words. I mean, I and also in writing that play, I I really started with because I didn't know who Jerry would evolve into. You know, mm -hmm. there there is a kind of mystifying thing that happens in writing. I know some people plan things out more, but I let the writing sort of lead me because I think that there's part of my instrument that knows more than my, uh, per the person in control knows, you know, and so uh, I, I, I didn't know who was going to show up. And I, uh, I did, I kept thinking, we should be on Jerry's side for the first couple of scenes where you go, really, he can't, what is her crazy brother doing and does he think he's gonna stay in her, you know? That seems like something that all of us would be a little uncomfortable with, or a lot of people would be. And I thought, you know, I'm interested in that suburban uh, logic of you, your brother can't live in the basement. And then Teddy's response to that is so, he's sort of like a holy fool, you know? I is so like, why can't I live in your basement? This space is here, you're not using it. He's got a kind of Marxist thread moving uh -huh. in through his logic. Who, the, again, you don't know who you're gonna side with until Jerry shows up and you go, oh my God, Teddy was <laughs> completely right. I think Jerry is a spooky guy. I kind of uh, somewhat believe that there is a demon in him. 
you can't judge that while you're writing it. You just have to understand it, I think. One of the reasons that you're quote unquote fast, that you can be so prolific and get rewrites in is that you seem to have this special talent that is described as getting into a character's head. A character head? Yeah, character head. I character. sometimes call it character head. Yeah. yeah, character head, which is kind of amazing. Did you always have that as an innate talent or did you develop it and how did you develop getting into oh. a character's head? Uh, you know, I, I've had it for a long time. Sometimes it's a, it's a kind of a curse because I can't, if they elude me, I can't, you can't really make them do <laughs> things. <laughs> you know, you can steer them once they start doing things. You go, okay, guys. But if they're, if they're sort of not doing anything, you know, if it's just not, if the spark isn't sparking, I have to walk around going, I don't know why, I don't know why they're not talking. I'm a little mad at them. So I used to do things like, get them drunk. You know, I'd be like, and now I'm going to put a bottle, because I thought, that worked for O'Neill. The first time I tried it, I really was like, here, have some, have some, you know, I think I started them on whiskey. And man, it works, you know, you get your characters a little juiced up. And so uh, sometimes I think it's, they're sort of like perform, I don't know what they are. I did a lot of acting uh -huh. when I was younger, you know, like in high school and college. I haven't done much since then. It's similar, it's like you stand inside the character and let it inform you. That's what actors do, I think. So you get the characters drunk, you don't get drunk. No, no, I don't, no, <laughs> no. I have been drunk, but not while I'm And writing. they do come back, or if, yeah, if they once never they, come back, do you abandon them? Uh, well, if they don't talk for a while, you kind of go, well, this isn't just, isn't growing the way it needs to grow. I had like a really interesting play I was working on at one point um, that they just wouldn't talk. I mean, I finally went, this isn't gonna work, I can't do it. Uh, and then I started on something else, Seared. That was when I started writing Seared, because I was writing this play for uh, on a commission and I couldn't get it to go. <laughs> and then my husband actually said, Teresa, those people are expecting a play from you. He does, he's not usually that proactive, but he, you know, he was the one who said, maybe you should write a play, a restaurant play. And this was Seared, yeah, which, became, which premiered seared. at uh, Williamstown. Yeah, it actually festival. premiered in, in San Francisco several yeah. years ago, and then I, you know, after that first production, I did some more work on it, changed the ending, and did it at Williamstown. And those characters just talk to you. I mean, oh, you got those a guys, character. You couldn't shut them up? Could not shut them up. <laughs> I mean, that yeah, when that happens, you're like, oh, thank God. Um, and right now I'm working on something that really was also like, are you guys going to talk or not? And then, like, at a certain point, it just... You know, but you do have to kind of shove at those things. And I, uh, my husband is it does he reads my early stuff. This is Jess. Jess, right? my yeah. husband Jess. Yeah, he's stage a stage manager. manager. He was a stage. stage manager. He was a stage manager. Yeah, right. It's extraordinary. Uh, the late great Alan Rickman mm -hmm. once described you as a restoration writer. What do you mean he by did. that? He basically said to me this thing about how when he performed my my when he was in, he was in seminar it made him feel the way he felt when he was doing restoration plays. And it was because the characters were kind of muscular and uh, verbal and argumentative and funny. And there was social commentary. I mean, I was like going, yeah, that's, you know, and uh, he said, and instead of saying fachaw, they said f <laughs> So I was like, got it. That's actually, I, I'll take it. You know, and they deal with moral issues and satire as well, yes, which it's you true. deal with. Yeah, it is true. I like humanity, but I have a kind of jaundiced eye about culture and society. I think that's that's also accurate ab about restoration comedies that they're people, uh, you know, or the ones I like. The people tend to be more real, um, but the situations fly. And they're a little crazy too. All of your plays, in, in a way, have people that are kind of on the edge. Um, well, yeah. I mean, like in Poor Behavior, there's Maureen. In Downstairs, there's Teddy. It mm. seems to me that you have a special place in your heart, or certainly compassion, for people who are crazy. Yes, I do. I do. <laughs> Why I, is that? Well, I think it's partially because I feel crazy a lot of the time. So there was one point when people were talking about Teddy and how crazy was he? Is he on the spectrum? And I was like, oh, that's bad news for me. Because I felt like Teddy was basically speaking my internal monologue. 
a lot of times. You know, that there are se sections of that play that, you know, there's like one piece when he goes, well, these people, they're kind of, they, no, it's, they're good, they're not crooks. They're, and then he goes on and on and on about this project that maybe he's gonna do that with him, and he sounds bananas. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, I've actually said that. I do have compassion for, uh, you know, that's constantly in reaction to a lot of the craziness of the world and mm -hmm. is sort of bewildered by that. Well, it's like, uh, is it like what Ian says in your play, Poor Behavior, which is insanity is just a sea that we're all swimming in? I suspect that's true. Yeah. I actually do. And, and I worry that that's true. Some of us just maintain it better than others. Yeah, some of us, you know, you can go back to T.S. Eliot, who says, uh, humankind cannot bear too much reality. I think that that's something that we're all, that we all are struggling with and not aware of, you know, that we have to shut down how crazy things are or we, we will go mad. Getting back to this idea of characters talking to you or not talking to you or abandoning them or not abandoning them, how do you know when a play is finished? Oh, I'm perfectly capable of messing with the play years after it's been published and done, you know. So there's a possibility that plays are never finished. You know, who said that thing about poems are never finished, they're just abandoned? Somebody uh -huh. said that, I don't know. Who. Yeah. But I feel like that's a little true. Although, because I'm often asked, people call me up and say, hey, we're doing this play. Do you mind if we do this, this, and this? And sometimes I think, sure, you can do that. And then other times I'm like, absolutely not, no. You know, there was one person who wanted to do, one, one theater in the South that wanted to do Mauritius and take out all the you know, all that fucks. And I was like, no, you actually can't do that with that yeah. play. That, that's, that's just the sound of the play. Other times I'm like, sure, I don't care. Uh, so I'm not like David Mamet in that way. <laughs> every comma. I mean, every and, comma, and, I don't, I don't and believe everything that. Else. Yeah. The other thing about, what's interesting about your plays and interesting about a lot of plays is overlapping dialogue, where mm. people are just talking over everything. That's happened more and more. My instrument kind of, uh, mutated into that. And how is it that you, you, you judge what the audience needs to hear in overlapping dialogue when it's just pop, 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 That's pop, a pop. really good question. There is an answer to that. I, usually I let the actors kind of mess with it and then say, if I'm not hearing what I need to hear, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and sometimes you go, oh, they really do need to know that this is an operative word. You know, there's like operative words that are like, um, especially when there's speeches, you know, because there's a couple plays, especially in Seared right now, there's speeches that overlap. And I'm like, you have to hear this word and then you have to, you have to hear this, or, you know, and you can circle the words for them. And that's usually enough of a, like a roadmap that, that suits. You once said to your students uh, a couple of things. Number one, you needed a draft first before you knew what you had. Yes. But you also told your students at one point you should really write about things that are going to ruin your life or can p potentially ruin your life. That's true. I did say that. Uh, what, what did you mean by that? What lesson did you want to impart to them? No, I think what I said was, I think this is slightly more accurate, being a playwright will ruin your life. So if you're going to do this, then make a count. You know, write about something big. Make it epic. You know, leave blood on the floor. I uh, stand by that because it is really challenging to be a playwright. It's very, there's a lot of heartbreak um, and confusion and uh, so many things can go wrong and <laughs> you don't get paid very much. Um, I just felt like, because I, when I started teaching, I don't teach a lot. I, I would have people bringing things to me that were very small, you know, that young people watch a lot of TV and so sometimes they watch things that have smaller stakes and I'm like, you have to reimagine a bigger universe in which your world really counts, uh, you know, what you're making up is large and filled with um, great questions, you and know. And bolder and braver. Yeah. Yes, yeah. um. so I was like, you because know, you swing went. for the fences is really the Well, you swung through the fences, and, and you've paid a price to some extent. I, I know that at one point you, you had a, a situation where you were on the couch drinking white wine by the inch. Yes, I was. What discouraged you to that point, and what got you back up and fighting? That's a hard one to talk about. I kind of don't like to talk about that event. I had, you know, I had a play that a lot of people felt very passionately about, and that it was... It was being really well received, and it, it was kind of a breakthrough for me, uh, just in terms of the, you know, the stakes of it and the production of it, and uh, 
and it got a really crazy review in the New York Times that was extremely demeaning around gender issues, which, in fact, the play wasn't even about gender. You mm -hmm. know, it was sort of like, it was such a distortion. It killed the life of that play. I mean, it, and a lot of people, because it was such a shock, it wasn't just a shock to me, it was a shock to sort of everybody who knew the play, who, you know, fans of mine, a lot of people in the theater. I had people telling me I'd never work in New York again, that, you know, that this was a sign of something very dire and this, you know, it was very, very disturbing. How did you come back from it? What got you back on your feet? I know that you're, I think you're, you're answering, your, your voicemail is a song by Chiwumba. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, I well, get knocked down. I get I knocked get down. A, I get a, but I get up again. How did you uh, get back, get up, back again? up again? You know, honestly, it really was, um, um, it was my son, uh, who was five years old at the time. I had a moment where I thought, he, he was very worried about me. He expressed a kind of like little boy concern. He literally said to me, Mom, are you all right? And I thought, I'm not going to be this mother. I'm not going to be this kid. He has a little bit of that in him uh, still. He feels like he, he's responsible for everything. And I thought, you're a five-year-old. You are not taking care of me. I take care of you. Uh, that really got me focused. And, uh, and then I, I didn't know what else to do. But you have to write, you know. You have to get back to the, to the work itself. Because you've taken a lot of, I mean, there's obviously the, the, the story of, of Smash and the problems with Smash that you've had to deal with. And I think in, in explaining what happened to Smash and the unfairness of it, you said, I'm a very stubborn woman. Um, oh, I did that, yeah, afterwards, yeah. Right, in terms of the postmortem of that. How has that helped you and how do you pick your fights in terms of being a very stubborn woman in this business? Sometimes it's, a, it's related to uh, how many different things I do. Uh, a lot of people are like, wow, you're such a diverse storyteller. And I, I admit that at this point now, I just have a lot of curiosity about, you know, I, w I wonder what that would be like. But for a while, I had to find, it was like zigzagging around, like when an obstacle would get too big, I'd go, well, I guess I'm going to have to go do this. And when I, I hit an obstacle in the theater, I finally went, I'm just going to go do TV. And I needed the money, but I also needed to be, stay a writer, you know. And so luckily I could move over there. And then, you know, so we, I, I started to see all the different ways to tell a story as kind of escape hatches. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd go through that escape hatch because, and let this situation over here cool off a bit. Yeah. Uh, it strikes me that you're fearless, at least that's the way, the impression that I get. And a lot of your characters, especially your women characters, are ferocious. They're fearless women. Uh, what frightens you? Mm. The New York Times. <laughs> 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 Those guys really scare the shit out of me. Uh, because I don't understand. There was one point when my therapist said to me, who do they think you are over there? And I was like, I don't know, man. <laughs> Uh, so I get scared of that. I certainly do get scared of that. I think that people have different natures. I'm not a naturally fearful person. I'm not a naturally patient person. You know what I mean? There are, mm -hmm. there are things that I do well and things that I don't do well. You know, when people tell me I should be more patient, I think, oh, really? You know, like, uh, uh, but, and so you have to learn things in life that life sends you, uh, challenges. Uh, but, uh, uh, learning to be brave was not, it was just uh, sort of in my nature. When people say you're so brave, I think, well, you know. You are brave. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I know, but it's sort of part of my makeup. And I you suppose know, my you, DNA. you take courage from the women that you write about. I, ta I do take courage from my work. I, you know, honestly, I'm very grateful. Even though a lot of things happen that I'm not excited about, I'm very grateful to be a writer. I love doing it. I have a strong muscle of the fun of appreciation of the fun of it. I was always doing uh, little things too, you know, like one act festivals. To, you know, when everyone was doing ten minute plays for a long time, I did so many ten minute plays, and like the real joy of doing that was sustaining. And now I know how to make little movies. I'm like, I could do that. <laughs> you know, I'm like so excited. I was so pleased to see Poor Behavior. That you know, it was really great, uh, fascinating, and exciting. 
to make that. We made that movie in seven days. Which and then, wrote Which I wrote and directed, and it's based on one of my plays. And it came out kind of like a Cassavetes movie. You know, I was like, wow, that's pretty good. And so then we just had a screening of it, and then I was watching it thinking, this, I could, I could do this again. It didn't cost that much, you know? And so sometimes, now that you feel that the means of production are more in your control, that's a much more relaxing situation. You know, the anxiety, you don't have as much anxiety. So maybe I would say the thing I'm afraid of is not working again, you know? And when, when I go through a dry period, I get terribly anxious, you know? We have to wrap up, but I thought in terms of wrapping up, we would talk about the fearlessness of your character, Sarah Bernhardt, uh, and if you wouldn't mind reading this excerpt from your play. Okay, thank you. I'm happy to. Ah, <laughs> No, I'm not afraid of death, nor is Hamlet, honestly. He's afraid merely of the night, the panic of the soul, the terrifying dread of meaninglessness. Gone in the light of day, but at night it is nothing but the most malicious of battles. Sanity is at risk at night, and that is finally where Hamlet puts himself. Turning a saint into a murderer is no mean trick. So I guess what you oh. write about in your plays... That's, yeah, I used to be afraid of the dead of night. I really did. Like when you, you know, I had such trouble sleeping for a long time and like at two in the morning your brain turns on you. It's very frightening. But in addressing that in your plays you offer some comfort to the audiences that they're not alone in the panic of the night. So for that I thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you Teresa for joining us. And thank you for joining us. We'll be back next month with another look at the bold and singular artists who live and work only to astonish us.